So I think everybody knows everybody except Alex. Alex Nudie the Biasi. Dave Biasi. Dave Biasi. Okay. Good. Good first time. <laughs> so thank you for coming and Ron for putting this together. So we're all pretty interested in this topic. I think there's a lot more people, but like you said, they're afraid to come. So anxious to hear what you guys have to say and how we can, I'm not sure, be more informed consumers of information. Thank you. And congratulations on the thank you. New England newspaper. Yes, thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 They, they get fed. New England. I might mess this up. New England Newspaper Association? Newspaper and Press Association. Yeah. yeah. So Michelle Ranowski Sherborn and Alex won the awards. What was your um, uh, mine was for editorial writing. Uh -huh. And Michelle's was for um, a, a couple of business stories she did about a new business opening in, in Bradford. So she won in the business category and I won in the editorial writing category. That's great. We're lucky to have you guys. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, a rough schedule. I'm recording this with a little camera here, and we'll put it up on online, hopefully. But uh, what we like to do, like like the previous events, we'll kind of we'll wing it, we'll get questions, Q and A, and all that. But what we'd like to do is just kind of briefly go over kind of history and kind of what has happened to bring us to this point, you know. Uh, and then to turn it over to Alex, and he'll talk about uh, newspaper industry and. Everything else that's, that's going on, the inside story on that. And then we'll, I've got some uh, videos from television that we can pick apart and talk about and stuff. So, does that sound good? No. All right, great. So, first, first meeting, first meeting, going all the way back, the first medium that ever existed was word of mouth, right? That was the first, the first one. And then uh, what happened shortly after there is, was the invention of the rumor mill, <laughs> where you have <laughs> the first fake news. Right? So, so that's that's something that's existed for a long time. That you know, information is not all the deck. So that, that's the first thing you need to know when you're looking at information is that you know is this accurate? And how to evaluate it? You know, is the source a good source and that sort of thing? So uh, then you know, the printing press, uh, Chinese invented printing press a thousand years ago, and Gutenberg you know, the movable type press five five hundred years ago approximately. Um, then uh, uh, the colony, uh, 100 years before the, the uh, revolution, they were bringing printing presses over. So that was, and that was part of what fueled the revolution was the ability to, to put out opinion pieces and stuff. And that's, that's mostly what it was at that time because the presses could only put out, you know, a couple hundred copies per hour. So they couldn't, you know, put out a whole ton of them. So they, mostly, it was mostly the image you know, all in acts and you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but then, they, uh, in the 1830, they, they hooked up the printing press to a steam engine, and they from a couple hundred uh, copies per hour to thousands per hour. And then later, in the middle of the century, they, they the telegraph, and those two things, the, the really fast press and the telegraph, really helped fuel the, the, the news, newspaper business. And by the end of the century, it was it was on the full board, you know, most people were reading a couple newspapers per day. It was, you know, a big deal. Well, Ron, when did the magazine stack? Magazine? Yeah, because that would be another, you know. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Hmm, I was just wondering myself. It's kind of, it's kind of, uh, I mean, you, you, could, you could think like an almanac is kind of like a magazine almost, so I don't know. Said, said evening post, I mean, you know, you did, or the time, or music. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. Looked that up. Then the, the, the turn of the century is when it really got. I don't think that. You, 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 uh, you know, photography and, and film. They started doing movie film. And, uh, you know, the early films were, they called them photo plays because they were, they were, it was kind of like taking a, a theater and putting it on film. So it was, a, it was kind of a, you know, that's, how, that's where they were at at that time. And then the telephone was invented, and the telephone helped fuel the, the word of mouth <laughs> medium. So they, they kind of play against each other and help each other. Uh, then radio, right, in the early part of the century, 20th century, um, and that, that really affected politics, you know, fireside chats, all that. Uh, then TV, uh, and TV has, has had a really good run. 
And that uh, was like in the 50s. So you had it in the late 40s, and then in the 50s is when everybody started getting their TVs, and in the 60s, everybody had a TV. It was a really, really fast take up on that one. And uh, they dominated for a long time. They were you know, the three, three networks of uh, CBS, NBC, and uh, ABC were the three networks, and they were dominant for, for a long time there. <clears throat> then cable came, and you know, a lot of a lot more channels. Cable, cable was, uh, does everybody know the difference between broadcast and cable? Anybody what? Between broadcast and cable TV. But broadcast TV is, is where they send it over the over the air like a, like your cell phone or a radio or something like that. That's, that's broadcast TV. And then cable uh, basically was, was invented for folks that were living in areas that couldn't receive the signal directly. They were too, too remote. So they put a, a tent up on a hill and they'd run cables down for people to get it. That's how the cable evolved. And then once they got cable, uh, there wasn't a limit on the number of channels. Or the, or it was much larger. So that's when we started getting all these you know, MTV and ESPN. And all, that, all those channels are cable channels. Um, and that, that really changed the industry quite a bit. Um, you know, up until then, there were just a few channels and, and each channel got a huge share of the audience. So, Everybody was kind of getting the same information. So cable was the first one of the things that uh, started to uh, separate people into, into different, more narrow niches in, in the information they got. And then when the internet came, that just really it's completely narrow cast. Some 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 content is is directed just to, to a few people. So it's it's, it's quite a change. Uh, another, another important thing on, on television is that. Um, the DVR was invented at the end of the last century, uh, in the 90s, I guess, when people started getting DVRs. You familiar with what a DVR is, a digital video recorder? Mm -hmm. how, how many people watch TV on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, the DVR will record um, mm -hmm. the shows ahead of time, and you can play them back. I do. And then when you play them back, if it's not linear, you can skip over the commercials. So that really affected the TV industry up, up until then. You know, they were just thinking, get as much audience as possible and would sell ads to that to, to smart to people wanted to put content in front of those advertisers. And so the DVR kind of changed that model a little bit. Um, and then it actually helped erode the uh there was something called the editorial wall between uh, sales and editorial, which is the idea is to try to keep the credibility of the news content. You want to keep the separation between the sales guys so that the advertisers can editorial content. But when the DVRs came, people were skipping on the commercials, they had to figure out something else that, that actually eroded the, that wall quite a bit. So, um, what else we got here? Let me make sure I the same thing here. Oh, we have the internet. <laughs> so the internet came, and uh, that, that really, that changed quite a bit. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really democratized uh, uh, the media. You know, up until up until then, he had to have a, a TV station or a radio station or a, you know, a, a, a newspaper or a printing press, something like that, to, in order to really get the message out to a lot of people. But uh, the internet changed that; it's democratized it, so any of us now can can uh, produce content and put it out there to people. And that, and that really, I mean, for 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 like Alex, people in, not 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 your newspaper in particular, but uh, for you know, television stations and all the newspapers and stuff, it's, it's been a hit to their bottom line, which is which is probably what, what they're done in their businesses. Right? That's, what, that's, why, that's what they do when they produce content. Their number one uh, goal is to produce content that's going to make them more money somehow, either by news or audience or even an advertiser or whatever. So, um, and that's the area that's changed it. But it's also made research a lot easier, too. So there's a, there's a plus and a minus for the people in the media. Um, okay, so I guess that's it. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Alex, and you can talk about your stuff. And then uh, I've got about 20 minutes or a half hour of, of content <laughs> when we play the, the videos. At the end. So okay. let you go ahead. Am I going to stay seated um, here? Sure, I'll just turn the camera. Can I say something? <coughs> sure. Uh, in our bedroom, all we get is YouTube 
And I saw an article where some people were saying that YouTube is actually like a channel. Uh, and it, it actually gets as many viewers as some, some networks. Oh, yeah. yeah. The internet now has surpassed uh, television, in, in, or at least in uh, revenue. So it's here. <laughs> it's arrived. Okay, Alex, thank you. Um, thank you, Ron. And again, my name is Alex Michi Debiazzi. I'm the managing editor of the Journal Opinion newspaper in Bradford. Sorry if anyone can't see me or hear me or anything. Just let me know. Um, we are, as probably many of you know, a very a small, small weekly newspaper um, in, in you know, rural northern New England. Um, and just a little bit about the paper, we are independently owned, um, which is a rarity um, in the newspaper business these days. Um, most, especially when you think of the major daily newspapers, even in our area, the Burlington Free Press, um, the uh, Concord Monitor, and even Valley News, part of you know, a, a, a group. Um, Free Press is owned by um, uh, Gannett, uh, at least for now. <laughs> um, so uh, our, when I say we're independently owned, we're owned by a, a, a lifelong uh, Grafton County resident, a lifelong cable resident, really. Um, and she worked for the paper years before um, she, uh, she bought it. So um, he's somewhat local, right in the backyard. Um, so anyway, um, that's a bit different uh, than a lot of the newspapers uh, across the country. Um, month or so ago when Ron walked up to the office and asked me to take part, I, um, I said yes uh, to, to, to taking part in this presentation and um, uh, neglected to mention to him that maybe I'm not the best person to give a presentation on media literacy because I don't have cable news or, <laughs> or any television whatsoever. Um, I don't watch TV. Um, I tend to avoid video on, on the internet um, and I'm solely a, a, an old school newspaper guy, which probably doesn't make me the best person to talk about media literacy in today's environment. On the other hand, um, it, it might be uh, also useful because I guess for me at least, especially in these past few years, um, I think it's, it's media literacy is almost an unattainable goal. And <laughs> what, um, that perhaps the best case scenario for us is, is to just be aware that that VD literacy is an unattainable goal. Um, however, don't be discouraged by that, and I'll get into, get into why. Um, uh, Ron or Elena, whoever put this flyer together describing tonight, really framed things very well. Um, and I just wanted to read a, a quick little snapshot of, of, from the flyer. Um, the way that media outlets collect, produce, and distribute information has changed dramatically in recent years. Information sources have become more diverse and democratic this means more of the responsibility of sorting out that information has been placed on us as citizens. This session will examine the history and trajectory of the media landscape, how content is produced and distributed, and how each of us can better understand the information we consume. Um, I really wanted to seize on some of these, some of these ideas expressed here because um, particularly the way that the media has changed in recent years that's 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 the understatement of the century in our business. I think it's really it's dramatically changed. Um, the internet, as Ron pointed out, is a big reason for that. But the changes have been going on for a long time, and even predate the internet. Um, and so, a lot of the issues that we face as citizens and as newspapers uh, and journalists have actually been around for a long time. I mean, the, all the issues that that plague us today when we hear about fake news or when we hear about um, maybe the wall breaking down between editorial and business um, have all been things that have plagued um, uh, journalism and its various offshoots and predecessors you know, for work for centuries. Um, the difference today is that um, because of the nature of the mediums that we use um, to communicate reporting and, and and news, it's a constant, constant barrage of information, and so we have less time to process um, a lot of the information that we that, that we need to be good citizens. Um, and so, uh, as it was pointed out, it's um, it, it's more responsibility is put it, is placed on us um, to really understand the information that we have um, that's been given to us. Um, 
So one thing I just wanted to touch base, Ron outlined the sort of the history of the, the going back to the printing press and even going back to the word of mouth. Um, and as you pointed out, it was, it was fake news, um, you know, early, early renditions. I just I recently got back from a conference, actually the one where we got that award in, in Boston, and was listening to a presentation about um, different models for work for, for businesses. And um, the presenter, a New York NYU uh, journalism professor, was talking about the, the first journalists. And I didn't really, I didn't really understand this. And I guess the first journalists were, um, it, if you go back to, to Western Europe and, and Southern Europe in the, uh, I believe it was the 15th and 16th century, um, wealthy patrons, uh, wealthy businessmen and mercantile men um, would pay employees to go to a foreign city-state and produce a regular newsletter describing the events that were going on in that, in that um, city-state. So, um, you know, describing both the going on at the, at the court, um, the prices of the, of the goods, um, you know, how popular it was, you know, the, the city governor or the, you know, the city head at that time. Um, you know, what were the rumors going around about, you know, perhaps frailties in the, in the family, the royal family that could be exploited by, a, by an entrepreneurial businessman. Um, so they were actually trafficking in fake news a little bit because they wanted to know the rumors and the gossip. And um, I'll have to say that anyone <laughs> to this day with you know someone who's really interested in in in, uh, in local journalism might have a <laughs> might be predisposed to enjoying gossip themselves. Um, so um, you know we we we. It's sort of a long tradition um, of sometimes of, of having to sort through fake news. Sometimes you're, you're reporting it directly to whoever's paying you to report it, and sometimes you say, no, we need to put that aside. It's not responsible to report that um, to most of our, uh, to our readers or viewers or whatnot. A um, couple more things I just wanted to, to touch on briefly, and, and I um, have to say I didn't have a, a presentation plan. I just wanted to engage in a, in a Q and A, if possible, if anyone has questions. But a couple things I wanted to mention too. Um, one really frustrating thing I think that is perhaps new. I'm trying to get a handle on it um, um, in this new changing landscape that we have with the introduction of the internet. Um, prior to the internet, really, I, I would say that the one leg a, a responsible newspaper had to stand on was its credibility. Um, it was essential that the editorial side, especially for local newspapers, had engaged their local audience and that their local readers and people and part of the, you know, the broader community believed that newspaper, what they had to say. Um, um, credibility was essential and that helped build the business side of things because retailers and advertisers would say, you know, I want to be a part of that, I want to support that. Um, with the advent of the internet and the way that we do business now and the evisceration of the retail side of things, especially in Main Street America, um, that's, unfortunately, that's changing. Um, and I don't really have a good handle on how it's changing and what that means for the journal opinion for other newspapers like that. but. What I'm seeing is a proliferation of media outlets online, and whether they're legacy, you know, the Washington Post or the New York Times, to a lesser degree, those, those organizations, but more maybe online-only outlets, is that you're seeing credibility not be the only leg that they're standing on um, from, the journalism, from the journalism side, from the editorial side, that they are thinking about how to work with funding partners. Um, to produce their news. This doesn't necessarily mean they're producing bad news or slanted news, it's just changing the way <coughs> that um, the editorial side is developing its news stories. Um, there's a whole swath of, of new interesting models for developing news. Um, again, at this conference in Boston, I heard a couple of interesting ones about, for instance, a, um, there's, a, there's a, a Dutch website um, I'm forgetting the name, I believe it was called The Information, but that might not be it. Um, uh, that started out of the blue a couple years ago and did a crowdfunding model um, to get started um, and had something, raised something like 
twenty or forty or sixty thousand dollars for the fund the first year of the operation, and, and a couple of years down the road, it was generating two million dollars in revenue. And what it did was it built a membership base, so kind of like subscribers, but exclusively members who pay the paper directly, um, and the members agreed to participate in the editorial decisions of the paper. It's not really the paper, it's website only. But, you know, um, it's, uh, um, so the reporters, who were mostly beat-based reporters, will engage members who have a certain expertise in their field to help produce stories. And that's, you know, that's sort of interesting. I mean, it's a very different thing, than, different way of operating than, than newspapers traditionally have in the past. And we're seeing more exploration and experiments with these types of ideas in the past few years. And that's, you know, it's newspapers in the U.S. for the past 150 years since really the advent of, of, of the, uh, the press in, in this country after the revolution have been um, reliant on advertising as a funding model. And it was important that that wall existed, that I mentioned, between the editorial side and the business side. The wall is you know, disappearing, unfortunately, but also because newspapers and their future um, versions of themselves will be relying on different funding models. Um, and so it's important for the reader, for us as the reader, who, to sort of understand how that might change the reporting of the news and how we understand the information that we get um, moving forward. Um, one couple of other things I just wanted to mention. Um, um, the proliferation of online outlets um, was supposed to give us a, a more democratic and more diverse um, media. Um, some of that has happened. Um, predictably, I think, what we've seen a lot of, however, is the existing large corporate media organizations, so I'm thinking like the Time Warners and the, you know, and, uh, the, the entity that owns CNN, Turner, and, and, and some of the larger corporates that were owning certain media organizations in the years leading up to the internet have moved in and taken over ownership of a lot of the uh, budding online operations. Um, that doesn't stop new online operations from popping up and, and filling a vacuum here and there, but you're seeing the um, let, you know, large corporate media organizations that were owning newspapers and, cable and TV stations in the years leading up to the internet playing a larger role in the media on the internet, kind of perhaps thwarting or stifling that democratization process. Um, and um, one other thing I just want to mention, I, I know I think I've already touched on this a little bit, um, uh, but just sort of summarizing and, and, and underlining that point about a lot of the issues that we're facing have been faced before. Um, uh, Ron touched on when, when television arrived on the scene and um, particularly how that had an impact on newspapers. And there was a lot of tension between television and newspapers. And I imagine some of this tension might have existed between newspapers and radio when that, when that start, started to develop a little. Um, and again, today, we're seeing a lot of tension between newspapers and online outlets, um, especially online-only outlets. Um, and um, a lot of this tension is, is um, um, I'm trying, how do I put this? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of a, it's, 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 it can be both a productive and, and a negative tension. It, it, it makes, you know, the, the long-held areas, of the, the more news organizations you have, the better the reporting will be. You know, competition is good for, for the quality of the of the product, um, and so to that to that end, that tension I think is, is good. Um, sometimes the tension doesn't doesn't work out um, quite that well, and, and there's a lot of resentment. And um, um, I just wanted to touch base a little bit on uh, there has long been that 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 tension between television and and, and um, newspapers and. Um, and that was a huge issue, you know, in the 80s and the 70s. And I was just trying to read up a little bit before this presentation. Um, and um, I wanted to read a, a, a brief little excerpt from a, from a transcript from this, uh, from this journalism conference back in 1985. Um, and um, 
So uh, this is a, a, a newspaper man uh, who's talking. Um, and he says, uh, we begin by talking about differences between newspapers and television. Nowhere are the differences more fundamentally portrayed than in the coverage of the White House. I am far more likely to understand what is really going on in the White House, what is likely to affect American government by reading David Broder or Jack Nelson than by listening to Sam Donaldson shout questions at the president or hearing Sam talk for a minute and a half on the evening news. When Reagan himself wants to go to the public, he's going to do it through television. But in terms of learning what's going on in the White House that affects my life, I'm far likelier to learn that from good newspaper reporters. I'm somewhat troubled when I hear um, uh, uh, Van Soder talk about the research evidence of people like television reporters. Um, yeah, the one, one thing I just wanted to talk about is that it's, it's, um, there's been, I think, perhaps mostly erroneous, but, but newspaper reporters have tended to look at broadcast reporters uh, maybe as, as more, as, I want to say more entertainers, but, but they're bringing an entertainment aspect to their journalism that, that newspaper reporters don't necessarily um, have or, 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 or carry on into, the, into, the, into their work. Um, journalism, newspaper reporting is, is sort of essentially is a, is a dry, sober subject of journalism, or at least it's supposed to be. Um, whereas there's that entertainment aspect to um, broadcast journalism. With the internet, we are seeing, you know, an even greater breakdown of those of those barriers, where where we're seeing really more of a of a mix or an intermingling between that um, between that uh, sort of dry sober approach of, from newspaper reporters of old and the uh, entertainment um, component that um, television reporters have brought into the field, um, and so that is something that I think as as a as a good participant in the civic democracy that, that you need to be wary of when you're consuming your news next week, five years down the road, or um, ten years down the road. And um, I would say no more, uh, in no place is that more apparent than in national news and national news organizations. Um, Maybe as I've, I'm extremely biased, of course, as a local news reporter. I, I really treasure local news and local uh, newspaper reporting, and um, or even you know any sort of form of local reporting. But um, national news, I, I am very sort of suspect of the reporting. And um, I think for me, for an example, is that is that um, when we look at presidential election, whether it's you know 2020 or 2016, um, or you know any other one, um, national media tend to treat that as uh, Treat presidential election as a sort of a monolithic story, um, whereas you know if you look at say something like primary voting, it's really more like 50 or 100 different stories um, because of the way of uh, how candidates present themselves in, to their local electorates in the primary. It's not a national election; it's essentially 50 different or 100, you know, 50 elections in, in 2016 or 2020, and 100 when it's a, an open seat like it was four years ago. Um, so. Um, you know, just something to, to keep an eye on, I guess, as we consume national media and large media organizations. It's not to say that local organizations like the Journal Opinion are immune to certain things like that, but, but you know, just something that I've observed. So, um, anyway, I hope that made a little bit of sense, and if anyone has questions, um, it's now an appropriate time yeah, to great. throw it out. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'll make a couple comments, just a few, few things that you mentioned. Sure. Uh, on the entertainment yeah. part, it has to be good. There was a movie in the mid '70s called Network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen that movie, mm -hmm. if you want a really good uh, satire on, on that whole process that was that was happening in the, in the '70s, yep. Where they, I mean, at the time it was satire. Now it's reality. I mean, mm -hmm. almost. So that, um, and you you were talking about uh, the demand on on people to to process all the information that they're being hit with. One of, one of the things that I noticed when I was researching the history is that almost without exception, all of the forms of, of, of these media, you know, when, it, when, when, when a new one comes, the old one is worried about the new one, but all of those forms are still with us. Word of mouth, uh, you know, uh, uh, press, uh, tele telegraph is now the telephone, uh, and, and actually evolved into the wire services which the, the newspapers use. Um, Film is still with us, radio is still with us, TV is still with us. So it's 
when, when, the, when the new form of media comes, it doesn't supplant the old one, it, it, it adds to it. So there are more and more and more and more things that need to be uh, considered and consumed by, by, the, by the people. Um, and, then, uh, and you mentioned about the, uh, uh, the, the new forms of, of funding uh, media and how that's going to affect the editorial content. And one thing that, that I've, I've been aware of out of a long time, especially with the national media, is it's not about what they're reporting, it's about what they're not reporting. It, it's, it's really important. And, and the, the, the coming of the internet has really threatened that model, that aspect of the media, so that they can no longer, uh, you know, when it was just the three networks, if, if there was something they didn't want people to know about, people didn't know about it. You know, it, was, it was pretty well uh, contained. But now with the internet, that they can no longer do that. People can, you know, they, they, people can get learn about something that, that isn't necessarily reported by the old media. So now that's one of the, the frictions that that we're dealing with. And kind of, I mean, they, they're even some people are even advocating for, uh, you know, some, uh, making changes to the First Amendment. Some of some of the people who are the lead, who are in power, you know, are there's a, in fact there's a bill or a, a proposal for an amendment to the Constitution that would allow Congress to 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 decide the content. No, to, 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 to prohibit certain, certain mm -hmm. speech um, in campaigns. The way it's worded, it would actually, if they want to, they could prohibit what we're doing right here today. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, a bill I mean, our own senator supports the bill, the, the, the amendment. So it's, it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a couple, a couple, seizing on a couple of things, um, that Ron mentioned um, just now is that uh, uh, he keeps an eye on, on what certain media entities are not reporting. Um, and that segues to, to media bias, which is, which is something I, I mentioned only briefly. But, but one of the, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of criticisms of, of news media organizations over the years, and, you know, most, <laughs> they're all fair. Um, uh, but um, um, one that you hear over and over and over and over is media bias, and and that's um, you know most of the newspapers in this country in the years immediately following the revolution were partisan newspapers. I mean they were explicitly partisan. There was no such thing as neutral press. They were politically partisan. They were set up to support um, and um, you know basically act as propaganda outlets for for um, one political party or another and, and attack the opposite party and, and you know its representatives. Um, so media bias is something that is woven into the into the fabric of, of news reporting history. But um, you know over the years um, reporting has largely tried to change because very thoughtful and enterprising businessmen saw an opportunity for um, neutral or impartial news organizations. There, were, there was an avenue there. Um, and so um, that's largely the model that's dominated for you know probably the past 100 years or 120 years now. Um, um, however, nevertheless, bias in media and in reporting is continues to exist, and um, I think one of, in some ways that's okay because um, you know most reporters will strive to be objective, um, and it's it's something that. You know, we will we will try to do because again that, that gets back to that credibility um, issue that we that we were talking about earlier. Um, but as anyone knows, it's 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 virtually impossible to be completely objective. Um, everything, all the information that you take in from your sources is, you know, sort of filtered through your own personal prism. Um, so you know, it's something that as a reader we need to or a viewer we need to be um, a little more. Um, you know, I guess attuned to. Again, I don't think that's really uh, that much of a problem. It's just something we need to be aware of. Bias in reporting, though, does come out a little bit more, as Ron mentioned, when newspapers don't report certain information. And that is kind of where you see bias a lot in some of your favorite or least favorite um, cable uh, 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 television outlets. Um, and um, particularly in stories that are pursued and stories that aren't pursued. And you see this a little bit too, starting to filter in lo local journalism. Um, it's 
that's where accusations of media bias can be. It's not necessarily in the actual reporting that's done. It's that it goes to the, you know, well, why didn't you do a story on, you know, on, uh, on that city councilman's relationship with, um, you know, with the business owner of the one contract, when you did do a story on the other councilman's relationship with a different contractor. So, I mean, um, that's, ten that's sometimes where you, you see a lot of media bias. Um, um, and, um, you know, it's, it's important to ask questions when you, when you consume, um, you know, your, your favorite reporting to be, well, you know, did they, they, did they report on that other council? Um, so anyway, so just something I wanted to touch on there. And then um, going again a little bit further back to the entertainment thing, um, one more thing, um, and I hope I'm not beating the dead horse of my, my <laughs> the broadcast journalism, but um, just going back to the entertainment aspect of it, um, one thing too that we've seen a little bit uh, over the past few years is this sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, but this celebrification of journalists and, and, and reporting and TV personalities, and you're seeing it more, you know, in the digital um, arena as well. Um, and it's something that's a little, it's, I don't know, it takes me back a little bit. I mean, maybe maybe it goes back to when we when we had the um, you know nightly news anchors who developed a, a reputation, but it, it's getting a little bit more. Um, White, call, white, but, but white, house, white House Correspondents Dinner. Yeah. Yes, yeah. White House Correspondents Dinner is an excellent example. Yeah. A book a year by a White House Correspondent. You know, I mean, do we, yeah. so it's getting a little bit. Uh, and then, Tweets. and then this is slightly more troubling is when you get the um, the relationships that um, some reporters will develop with their sources, and um, uh, that's sometimes where you see a little bit more bias because in itself. I think it's most. Um, apparent maybe in political news, but I mean to say that you know local news reporters often have relatives on the school board or kids on the school or you know our neighbors are you know got arrested for drunk driving or something like you know whatever. But it doesn't matter. But you see these issues a little bit on the local level too, and I can tell you it's it's the worst thing in the world to report on something that. You know, if I have a friend who's done something that's going to portray them in an adverse light, it sucks. I don't want to do it, and um, you know, it, 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 it's it's difficult. Um, and so that's you know, <laughs> try to do what I can, but um, you know, it, it, these issues can also sort of play out at the local level. It's not just far away in Washington D.C. and New York City. Anyway, you know, one one thing I noticed on on, on the TV side, I, I I have dyslexia, so I. I read a general opinion, and you know, maybe a couple times a month I read you know, the New York Times or something. But uh, I, I consume a lot of uh, video, you know. and one thing I noticed, about, like on the cable channel, it's it's the, the bias, individual reporter biases, is fading away. They're they're pretty much in line. You know, if they don't, if they don't tell the company line, they're out. Yeah, so, people don't have a job. Yeah, yeah. So the the bias there is. In the sea, in the sea suites, you know, from the the whoever owns the, gotcha. the, the the ownership of the, the station. Or the the entertainment doing. aspect of it, you know, at some point, and I don't know what years it was, but when everybody went to TV for their news, it did become showy. You know, it was people are made up beforehand. They got a nice suit on, and blonde-haired, good-looking gal telling the stories. And all, it, it's like, well, you had to keep up. So all the channels had to do that, all the, the organizations. And it, uh, that probably fell in with when it really became corporatized. Mm -hmm. And it just has gotten worse, you know. I, I, I've seen a couple of different things where they showed um, the only actual, it was the lead-in, and it was like, it took all the major networks and even the cable networks news and from around the country and all the, the everybody was represented because you'd say, you know, it would say, you know, NBC Charlotte or something, mm -hmm. Channel 5. And, well, tonight's story, and uh, there's, there's several of these like on YouTube and it's like oh, they right. all, it's scripted. It yeah. Everybody says the exact same words. Yeah, you know what you know what that is. That's the uh, the, the, the TV stations 
Now, it used to be there were, you'd have independent stations you know, where, where it's, uh, a guy would own one or two stations. Now they're all station groups. It's, it's first television, gray television, uh, and, and, uh, mission media group, and then uh, next are, I think, are the big, big ones in our area. And they, they, you know, like Hearst owns a couple dozen stations, but uh, next door they own a couple hundred stations. And what they do is they, they literally, you know, make sure they really get yeah, the memo. So what they yeah. send the memo, say, okay, this is what you, this yeah. is what you guys got, all got to say. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's, it's kind of there, there's there's this, this the, the ownership is by it can be by groups like that. You have O and O's which are owned by the networks, the networks themselves, ABC, NBC, or Fox, who, who own some stations. And then, and then some of the content uh, comes uh, through syndication. So you have uh, either like a, a, an ownership group or, or, or somebody else who, who produces content and then actually tries to sell it to, to the station groups or to, to stations or to the network. So it's, but, well, if they sell to the networks, then it's considered network content. But if they, if, otherwise, it's called syndicated content. And, and the way all those various ways of producing that content are done can affect the biases that, that come through. This would probably be a good time to have any well, just, questions. Of, I was going to say, you know, I get all my news from the radio, from National Public Radio. And I think they're pretty neutral. I'm not, I, well, one first thing I will mention when you say public radio, and this is, this is the, the, the fascinating thing about public radio to me is that it is that membership model where, where you have members Subsidized. I mean, of course, there, there's a little bit of public funding, as right. we all know, and, yes. and there, there's a little bit of underwriting by corporate or, or business sponsors. But essentially, public radio is supported by membership, right. um, which is which is, might be a model that you see moved over to you know online or or news or print outlets in the, in the future. You might see. So public radio is sort of an outstanding example of that, and something that they do. Um, and I think I think from a from a from a content viewpoint perspective um, about neutrality is that yeah I agree I mean I think that I think the reporting that that they do on a regular basis is pretty reliably neutral. I, would or I should say neutral, but you get both sides. You get both sides, and I, what I would say is that when when they do deviate from that, it's usually because they haven't done a story that portrays one side in an adverse light. But they did do a story that portrayed, you know, uh, the other side in an adverse light, or, or you know, positive light. I, either way, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, I see that a little bit uh, on public radio as well. Um, I don't watch public television, so I will say, but um, the the reporting that public radio, I think, yeah, I mean, and, and even in in our worst extremes of, of the cable TV shows. Um, cable TV networks. There are reporters for these cable networks that are outstanding reporters. I mean, so this is so, this is what makes it really challenging for us, the consumer, <coughs> is that there's still really good reporting being done at, at almost explicitly biased, you know, uh, um, uh, networks or outlets. Um, but you know, sometimes it gets it gets drowned out by the by the talking heads and the, and the, and the editorial side. You know, the, the, not the editorial side, but the, the, the side expressing a strong uh, viewpoint. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A proliferation of, of news outlets. News. I mean, it must be the public just loves to be saturated with news uh, because news has just expanded all over. You get it on the internet. You get it on the radio. You get it on TV. And and not just one channel. You get you know many <coughs> channels. And then the competition <coughs> must be very keen. I would think. Between all these, I I would hope so, especially because I'm not sure where, <laughs> for the, especially for the online outlets, I'm not sure where all the revenue is coming from to sustain yeah. their business models. And you see, just as many new ones pop up, uh, there are other ones that vanish. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of it's it's an interesting sort of a wild west environment I think right now. Um, the the thing about the um, um, uh, 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 Demand for news um, is, on the one hand, yes, the public still wants news. They still want information, whether it's about their local communities, you know, what's going on in, in Orfordville or, 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 you know, up the road in Vermont, or whether it's about what's going on in, in Concord or Montpelier, or what their senators and congressmen are doing down in, in D.C. However, going back to um, uh, this gentleman's point about about um, 
about uh, uh, TV and, and entertainment, um, as we're seeing a lot of video, there's also this celebrification type types. We're seeing a lot of mixing of news with entertainment. And, and that's, I think, that appeals to you know, a wider audience than, than maybe the, you know, the, the dry, sober um, um, you know, reporting of, of, of your used to appeal to. So, so that's, I think, where some of that demand is coming from as well. You know, another thing that affects that is because there are so many different outlets, it's difficult for consumers of information right. to track sources, to track who, who's a credible source and who isn't. You know, we all know the, the guy who lies most of the time, right? We know, we know he's not a liable source. I, I, um, I saw a documentary of some sort recently, and they went through the whole development of network. The, the airways, when TV started and all, and up until, well, the 90s, the final kibosh got put on, but it was, it was public airwaves. The public owned that. You had broadcast companies and all that, and it was usually on a local scale. And as time went on, because they needed advertisers to stay on and all, but that crept in and started to drive it, and nobody realized that we actually lost that public owning the airwaves and you know, because you had you had antennas on your roof you know you didn't have cable and everything else and you didn't get all the channels but grew up we got two we got cbs and, and abc we couldn't get uhf channel 30 you know um and and then in the 90s and it was colin Powell's son was the fcc commissioner i believe and it had to do with, I think, when Time Warner bought everybody, and they became, and and they were, and they changed the rules that you couldn't own like newspaper and television sort of and radio in a select in a in a certain mm -hmm. amount of area and all that because you were monopolizing it, and it sailed right through. They pushed it as a great thing, and now we have corporate news. Yeah, you know, one, one, of the diff one of the differences, the big differences between newspaper and, and TV and television is that that television used to be all broadcast and, and the airwaves are considered a common resource. It gave uh, Washington huge control over what was going on in television, but the newspapers were still free to, you know, they were still 100% covered by the First Amendment. But you saw, like, Dan Rather, Dan Rather got kicked out because, um, because Bush was going on there, basically. I mean, it, there, there was a, you know, an ostensible reason for, for getting out, but that's, that's why he, he, he left CBS and his book going on there. So it's, it's huge. Let me, uh, I've, got, I've got a few here. We're probably going to run over. I don't know. Is everybody okay with that? We've over more than an hour. Um, what, what I did is over the last few weeks when I knew that, that we were going to do this presentation, I um, put together or, or tried to gather yeah, content off of the. Uh, can somebody shut the light off the roof? It's, uh, I forget which one it is. So I, I just kind of collected some random stuff over the last couple of weeks and just to demonstrate uh, on the TV side the way that they do things. They, uh, when you're doing something in print, like an interview, uh, the reporter can make decisions as to what he puts into the, the article. But in television, they, they do it through editing. So I just wanted to show you one. Here's one that's, this is strictly entertainment. Uh, it's a late night show, Jimmy Kimmel. Um, but a lot of these late night shows are starting to try to emulate news shows now, which is really got to be confusing some of the low information consumers. But I'll just play this and, and, and just watch it, and then we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, yeah, uh, if it's not too complicated. Is that too complicated? You will do it. Yeah. And are people overly impressed by that? Not my wife. <laughs> 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 she expects it, and you do it. Yeah. yeah. You uh, worked at the first. Is, was it the first Crate and Barrel in Chicago? Yeah. Yeah. 
When yeah. was that that you worked at Crate and Barrel? Because I love this idea, this business. It was for about four months until I got fired. You oh, they fired you? Yeah. Why did they fire you? I came back late from lunch. That was it? Yeah. What was your position there? I, I vaguely remember that I was either, uh, it was their first store. Uh huh. And uh, um, the couple that owned the company were still there. Was this Crate and Barrel? Crate and Barrel. Yeah. What was your job there? I was uh, um, the incompetent manager of the store. Oh, you're the manager of the store? I think so. <laughs> oh, wow. Was the store more rustic? Like, was the stuff more, more substantial there back then? There were crates and barrels. There were actually <laughs> crates and barrels. <laughs> stuff was in crates and barrels. <laughs> Hence the name, I guess, huh? <laughs> well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, well, I have a bunch of things to talk to you about, including the new yeah. movie. All right, so. The, did anybody notice the edits that, that yeah. were made there? Yes. There were two. There were two edits in there. Yeah, at least two. Yeah. Maybe even this, three. And this this one was these were actually pretty easy mm. to, to spot. Mm. Um, and are people overly impressed by that? Now, look at look at where his cup is. Yeah. Is placed and watch where it changes. Not my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she expects it and you do it. Yeah. yeah. You? Did you see see how it changed? Yeah. Yeah. That this moves in. Yeah. So that, and there was another one here. Gee, you, you, this is something that they that they do and I, on a show like this. This is an entertainment show, and it's expected. You know, they want to make it as entertaining as possible. It's not they're not trying to convey information or anything. But when they when they do it on a new show, then it's. And they um, do it on a new show. Oh yeah. Do you yeah. have one that shows a new show? I've got a couple of them here that. Um, this one's kind of long and complex, and it's kind of the subject area is a little um, controversial, but I think we can handle it here at this group. As this review of the historical record proves, presidents have long recognized that the Constitution compels them to honor subpoenas served by the House in an impeachment inquiry. Stated simply, President Trump's categorical blockade of the House, his refusal to honor any subpoenas, his order that all subpoenas not even knowing what they were, all subpoenas be defied, has no analog in the history of the Republic. Nothing even comes close. He has engaged in obstruction that several of his predecessors have expressly said is forbidden, and that led to an article of impeachment against Nixon. President Trump is an outlier. He is the first and only president ever to declare himself unaccountable and to ignore subpoenas backed by the Constitution's impeachment power. If he is not removed from office, if he is permitted to defy the Congress entirely, categorically, to say that, that subpoenas from Congress in the impeachment inquiry are nonsense, then we will have lost, the House will have lost, the Senate certainly will have lost all power to hold any president accountable. This is a determination by President Trump that he wants to be all-powerful. He does not have to, rep to, to respect the Congress. He does not have to respect the representatives of the people. Only his will goes. He is a dictator. This must not stand. And that is why another reason he must be removed from office. Okay, so that was, that was just a segment from the uh, impeachment trial. And it was... Um let me, I'll, I'll, play, I'll play just that last two sentences that he did again, um, so you can hear it, because he's kind of a lawyer and it's kind of complicated what he, what he said there. But if he is not removed from office, if he is thing. permitted to defy the Congress entirely, categorically, to say that, that subpoenas from Congress in the impeachment inquiry are nonsense, then we will have lost, the House will have lost, the Senate certainly will have lost all power to hold any president accountable. This is a determination by President Trump that he wants to be all powerful. He does not have to, rep to, to respect the Congress. He does not have to respect the representatives of the people. Only his will goes. He is a dictator. This must not stand. And that is why Another reason he must be removed from office. So, 
So, he's, so, so what he's saying there, he's saying if, if we as Congress don't act, then these bad things will happen. And Trump will think that he is, that he is a dictator and he can defy Congress. See, see what he's saying? It's a, compli it's a complicated sentence. He's a lawyer and, and, and it's kind of complicated, but it's, if you look at it very carefully, it's, he's saying if we don't do this, then we will lose power to hold him accountable. And he will think that he doesn't have to respect Congress and that he is a dictator. That's what Trump is trying to say. That's what he's saying here. Right. Right. So, so now I'm going to show you how that was reported by NBC. Okay. It's just, it's, and it's very rare, actually, to, 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 to be able to get the raw video and then get what the, what the people actually edited. So this is, this is kind of a... If you can find it, if you can find the raw video and then see what, what a news outlet does, that really gives you insight into it. So this is NBC? This is NBC's report okay. on okay. the impeachment trial. Okay. You sound for that day. Now to President Trump's impeachment trial where Democratic prosecutors argue the president engaged in a cover-up and should be removed from office as his defense team prepares for their turn to fire back. Peter Alexander has late details. Tonight, House prosecutors for their third and final day making their case to the jury zeroing in on their charge that President Trump obstructed Congress by stonewalling their investigation. President Trump's obstruction of the impeachment inquiry was categorical, indiscriminate, and historically unprecedented. Capping off their argument overnight that the evidence against the president is overwhelming. And you know, you can't trust this president to do what's right for this country. You can trust he will do what's right for Donald Trump. But today, Republicans say Democrats have not delivered. Well, we've heard all the evidence that they said was overwhelming, and I'm underwhelmed. Democratic prosecutors say the White House obstructed by refusing to turn over a single document in response to House subpoenas. He is a dictator. This must not stand, and that is why another reason he must be removed from office. Obstruction of Congress is what the, count, uh, the founders called separation of power. The case that the Democrats are, are making is ridiculous. All of it comes as ABC News were... Okay, so did you, did you see what they did? They took that, they took his last... Mm -hmm. they, they cut, they cut his, his quote. Yeah. If he, yes. They, yeah, they yes. just... They, and, and they made it look like he was saying that Trump was a dictator. But what he said here was that Trump would think that he was a dictator. You see how they, they changed that just by... They didn't even have to do much editing. All they had to do was pick up what he was saying at this point right here, where he said he is a dictator. And the reason he must be removed is because he was a dictator, which is completely different than what, what actually happened. So that's, that's, that's just an example of a very simple edit that can, can completely change the, the meaning of, 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 of what actually happened there. Um, let me see, here's, here's another one that's, yeah. this is, uh, this is, this is, uh, uh, I'm here to remember this show, Matter of Fact. This is um, Soledad O'Brien. She, she's, she's been around for a long time. She's a really seasoned reporter. And this is, this is a show that's been uh, produced for the last few years. And it's produced by Hearst Television, which is the, the television group. Remember something about the television groups? They, they actually back this, this production of this uh, show. Um, they, they, they're the ones who own the WMUR and two other stations around right here. But so, so her reporting is she she's, has a little bit more freedom than than the national or the or the cable channels, and and so she reports on different things um, uh, that you might not hear otherwise. She had in other words, she, this is a case where the, the actual reporter has more freedom in choosing what she's reporting and how she's reporting it. But I just want to show you this segment here, and I want you to watch it very carefully and see if you can identify the, the points where she uh, makes edits. She, she, this is like a half hour show, so she's limited to only four or five minutes of, of, for each story that she does. So, so her, her stories are highly edited, but I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, she's a seasoned reporter. I don't think she's doing anything pokey here, but it's just, uh, just see if you can identify the is America an oligarchy? Well, first, let's define oligarchy. According to Merriam-Webster, one definition is government by the few, a wealthy few. Well, now a new book takes a look at how two powerful families rose to wealth and power in America and what that could mean for democracy. 
Award-winning investigative journalist Andrea Bernstein is the author of American Oligarchs, The Kushners, The Trumps, and The Marriage of Money and Power. And she joins us from New York. It's so nice to have you. Your book is amazing. Um, let's begin by talking about this idea that this potentially is an oligarchy, because I think that the wealthy have long been involved in trying to grab power well before 2016. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I wanted to look at in the book, so I covered the 2016 campaign. After the 26th campaign, there were about a zillion analyses of what happened. But they really focused on sort of the moment. And I wanted to ask the question, what were the forces at play that produced this presidency? And specifically, because I've covered money and power for about forever, I wanted to ask, what were the trends in American democracy that produced the Trump family, and also, how did they themselves help accelerate these trends? And you're right. I mean, America has always had more or less control by the very wealthy of our political system. And if you go back to the Gilded Age, the late 1800s, which was actually when Donald Trump's grandfather arrived in America, you go back to that period, Everybody understood that the monopolists, the sugar cartel, the coal cartel, the railroads were running America. But what happened after that is there were a series of muckraking reporters, and there was a progressive movement, and really a backlash. I see so many contradictions outside of even Trump and Kushner, where you see, I mean, people will poll, will say they'd like to see billionaires, and they'd like to see big companies pay more in taxes. But they don't follow up with that in actually not supporting those businesses. They buy iPhones, they have Amazon delivered to their houses, and they, it seems like they don't see a contradiction in that. Am I wrong about that? Well, I think there's a couple of things that are going on. First of all, it's very hard to opt out of these systems because they're designed to seduce you and entice you and make it easy to use them. So that is very, very hard. But also, people are a product of a very deliberate attempt to create a social consensus that taxes are bad and that tax avoidance is good. Whereas what's happened in all of the successive tax cuts, the national tax cuts that began with Reagan and lasted through the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, when you look at that, what's happened is that each time the way that these bills get passed is there's an argument, oh look, we have to close the loopholes and make the system more fair and we're going to lower taxes. But each time you lower taxes, you corrode the idea that paying taxes is a good thing. And that in itself stimulates tax avoidance. So you have the situations where these big corporations have these headquarters in a place that doesn't even exist, somewhere between Bermuda and Ireland, so they can avoid taxes. So that is what is happening overall in the country. And it frays the social consensus. It increases wealth inequality because the rich corporations and the very wealthy get to keep more of their money and it also allows them to influence politics and we see this all the time in the Trump administration. You just have to go to his hotel or book a room or become a member of his golf course or maybe buy a condo and get yourself in front of Trump and he will look favorably upon you. This is not a secret. It happens before our eyes every single day of his administration. So if we are on the brink of an oligarchy, as I think you argue successfully in your book, what's the implication of that? What does that mean, not just for right now, but you know, 20, 50, 100 years out? Well, I mean, I think democracy is really in trouble. And what happened the last time America faced this, during the Gilded Age, is that people pushed back. And that has been American history. But it is, past isn't always prologue. And it's something that the founders understood everybody in America would always have to fight for. Because wealth and money would always influence politics. Later, Bernstein. The book is called American Oligarchs. So nice to talk to you. Thanks for joining me. Okay, so that, did, did you notice any, yeah, any edits in that one? When they, they were showing me old photographs of the, I'm talking about the yeah. fellows and all that, and then it jumped, you could tell that she was going to explain that part of it more, and then it went right into, oh, but. Yeah, yeah, they were, it's much more subtle. This is much more difficult on this. Than, than the other one that I showed you. 
Um, that that which, which, where they went to show the old images and all that stuff yeah. that you're talking about, that's, that's called a cutaway. And sometimes you'll see them, they'll, they'll, if it's like a live audience, they'll, they'll, they'll cut away and show audience reaction. Yeah. And that's a way to cover their edits so that they can edit something out without it being covered. <laughs> oh, so this, this they one go here, to the book cover, though. For, yeah, they'll show yeah, the book cover or, or whatever. whatever yeah. mm -hmm. Whoever edited this is a really good editor because they get, it was very difficult. I, I went through this. I, I counted seven, seven different edits in this thing. Um, and, and I had to put it in slow motion to, and, and look at her eyes and her mouth and everything try to figure out where, where they were doing it. So it was a very, very good edit. Now, I, I, you know, a lot of people in the industry don't have a problem with this. They, they think it's, you know, it's, it's the same as if, if you were writing. Mm -hmm. If you were writing the thing, you, you would cut things out. And really, it's, it, it's what they cut out. You know, what, we don't know what they're cutting out unless you have access to the raw video. I, 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 I wrote to her and asked her if we get the raw video. And she, and get a response. So, so we don't we don't know what you cut out, but um, I mean it could be something something as simple a technical reason a mic goes bad or something like that. It could be um, uh, uh, liability issues. You know she 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 start talking about companies there. You say these companies aren't paying taxes, and mm -hmm. then they cut it. So mm -hmm. so I, I suspect well maybe mm -hmm. she started listing companies and and stole it in a low budget production. Maybe didn't want to take the risk of a lawsuit, so they cut that out. You know, so there's a lot of different reasons why they might cut it out, or it could be biased. You know, maybe she, you know, when she was listing the the the, 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 the elites, you know, she was listing all the elite uh, industries. Maybe she said newspaper, or media, or, you know, and then maybe they cut that out. I don't know, but it's. Uh, I mean, she, she she's she's a pretty reliable source, right? So, so what is this matter of fact? Is this on <clears throat> is this internet or is this? It's once a week. Um, okay, on cable or. Uh, well, no, it's, 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 it's produced by Hearst, so all the Hearst stations uh, presumably carry it. And it's, and it's now, it's actually carried, when they first started, I think it was just Hearst. This is, this is what's called, when I was talking about syndicated content, mm -hmm. that's what this is. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this uh, television group sponsored her to, to, to put together this, uh, this show. Mm -hmm. And she puts it together, a half hour show, done as cheaply as possible. And they sell to, uh, to, to, you know, advertisers that maybe you can't afford you know, big media ads, and they put it together, and then they try to sell it to, to, to TV stations. Mm -hmm. And when it started out, I think it was just a few, but now they, they've got like 90% uh, of the market now, the, the uh, national market for this show. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's on, uh, let me see, yeah, it's, it's, it's put up against the Sunday morning show, so... Um, I think that's against the Sunday morning shows? Well, it's, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of them there right, between right, 9 right, and 11 right. o'clock. It, it's in there somewhere. I think Channel okay. 20. Okay. Um, mm. uh, this is a WPTV, I think, which is the Hearst. Uh, I, I think they have it at uh, 1130 on Sunday night. Yeah, it, it broadcasts twice on Sunday. Yeah. Oh. It's in the morning and then it's, and then it's in the evening. Mm -hmm. if you miss it, or it's printed or something. Mm -hmm. Do they sometimes... <clears throat> Manipulate the rate of speech to make people sound better or possibly worse. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I don't know. Uh, possibly. Certainly, I'm sure they do that. They, they do that on commercials all the time. Mm -hmm. and not, 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 you know, as I say, a lot, of, a lot of people in the industry don't think don't have a problem with this. I, I personally have a problem with it because it's not. Um, it looks to the to the Consumer like it's unedited. You know, um, I think it would be better if they put, you know, where they if they make make an edit have something like a, a fade in, a quick fade in and out, or something that indicates that some, that there's a piece missing. I think that would be a little bit more honest. In fact, here, here here's a here's a response. Just, this video here. Uh, this is um, contact with any known listen to, listen to what saying. or coronavirus patients, nor does he have any symptoms. President Trump remains in excellent health and his physician will continue to closely monitor him. We will have more of my interview with Joe Biden. You are seeing the interview in its entirety. Every word of every question, every word of every answer. You're going to see all of that when we come back. You'll hear uh, Joe Biden's reaction to what some women called the gut punch of Elizabeth Warren dropping out of the race last week. And listen carefully to Joe Biden's answer when I ask him if he would choose a vice presidential nominee from the group of presidential candidates who have run against him. You'll also hear Joe Biden respond to Bernie Sanders' charge that the Democratic establishment forced Amy Pulver. Okay. Did you notice what he said up in the beginning? 
to every word, every yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm going to give you every word of your, so every so he, he, he got the memo, he, 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 he now this is, a, this, I don't know if everything that he does is unedited, I don't, I don't watch his show on a regular basis, but at least he's, he's thinking about it, and he's thinking, mm -hmm. okay, maybe we should move in that direction. And that, I think that's why C-SPAN uh, has become so popular, because they're, when, when you watch C-SPAN, how many people watch C-SPAN? Yeah, I watch it. Yeah, it's, one, one, of the, one of their taglines is uh, unfiltered news, you know? so, and it is, they, they, don't, they don't make any edits, they need them, you just set up the camera like we're doing here today, you just set up the camera and let it run and don't make any edits at all. Um, let's see, oh, here's one, here's one other, this is another aspect that we haven't, we haven't touched on today, um, but I think it's really important. How, how, many, how many people uh, remember the movie A Top Gun? You remember that movie? Very good. You ever see it, it was in the mid 80s, I think? It came out. You think it was a good, yeah. well produced movie? Yeah. Yeah. It's a 10 year old kid, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Maybe not your genre, but yeah. it was a well produced movie. You just think of anything weird about it or anything or controversial other than it's military based? No? Okay. Yeah, see it, so. uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Let me show you this ad here really quick. One of the, one of the ways that uh, advertisers and content generally tries to, you know, the purpose of that is to influence behavior, ultimately, is to get people to do something, to buy a product, to, to vote for somebody or whatever. And, and one, of, one of the ways they do that is to model behavior. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll show people buying the product or doing whatever it is. So, so watch this ad right here and uh, see what you think about it. Sound power is defined as to a surface, a product of sound pressure uh, and a component of the So the way they're, what, they're, what they're advertising on the surface here was the Facebook's group, I don't, I don't know what Facebook's, so I don't know what it is, but it's some new feature on Facebook that they're trying to advertise uh, groups, right, to get, their, so, their groups are so narrow they can have a group just for kazoo's are to get people specific into it. But what, what, were, what, what else were they modeling there, or what were they showing the, the people doing the kazoo player, what were they doing? They were sitting in a classroom, right. yeah. learning, yeah. learning, yeah. learning, in school, learning something, and, and, and oh no, you don't want. You know. instead, yeah, yeah. Instead, instead, out. you guys should go play play the kazoo instead of learning. Right? That's what they were modeling there. And I'll play it one more time. This time, look at uh, the ethnicity of, of the people in the ad. Mm -hmm. Sound power is defined as, to a surface, a product of sound pressure uh, and a component of the Go and watch that movie again with that filter. You know, looking looking at the ethnicities of people in the movie. It'll really open your eyes. And if you do that over and over with 
other content, it'll, it'll really change your perspective as to what's going on in terms of racism in the media. So mm -hmm. anyway, that was, mm -hmm. that was something that, uh, okay. oh, just one, here's one more, this is just for fun. You know, you, we talked about new, new, new uh, the internet and new, new tools for, for reporters that they use new, new tools and stuff like that. Here's a reporter, uh, I forget, it's WLOS, and I forget where they're located. This is a guy doing a spot, you know, remote, or a, a, a remote spot, you know, how they send reporters out to do a, do a news story. Mm -hmm. And he is trying to use this, uh, I think it's Facebook Live or something is what it's called. It's a, it's a way to use it. Instead of having a big bulky camera out there and everything, he just had his cell phone. And he gave his cell phone to somebody to, 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 to tape him while he's doing this report. Mm -hmm. And see if you can detect what, that he had a setting that wasn't quite right on this. See if you can look at it. Hello, Justin Hinton coming to you live from Madison County, a snowy Madison County. Um, a lot of snow has certainly fallen and has fallen. If you take a look at the ground, you can see it's covered. But when it comes to the roads, they're actually looking pretty good. There are a lot of cars that have traveling along this way. We're really pretty close to the Tennessee border. Folks know that this is the spot was, that this is just his raw feed does get a lot of snow when it does snow. So we come up here quite often and show you what we're looking at. This, this, this is just his raw feed to, yeah. the, to the studio. Now, it actually went out live on the station like this. But, but you'll hear him talking, but you won't hear the uh, anchors. So they're, 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 you know, in the studio, they're switching back and forth between the anchors no. and things like this, you know, whatever. But this is just his raw feed from his phone. Let me, let me put this forward. It's coming down, not quite like this, though. Um, this is a bit more than what we saw, especially at Marcy University. We also Marshall earlier today. Not much snow. This is maybe an hour, hour and a half ago. It was slush. Uh, more so than anything else. But uh, we are starting to see more of the snow. Helen, you asked me where we are. Uh, we are just off of 26, on the, um, kind of heading towards the Tennessee, the, near the Tennessee border, and we into like the Wolf Laurel area, kind of where we are. Um, so it's Boxy Haywood again, so like, yeah, that's the key, folks. If you do have to die, you do want to be careful. Again, here in Madison County, we're just seeing some wet roads. It's avoided by kids from school. Some pictures of this thing and what you all do. All of a them. To us on our chime in feature, you can do that on our app, or you can also do that on our website. We'd love to see the snow pictures and, and what you all do out there, uh, whether it's your animals who like to play in the snow sometimes for the first time. This is really the first uh, legitimate snowfall we've seen uh, this this season. Um, so I know a lot of folks are certainly excited about that. And, you know, the first thing that, that schools really get canceled, kind of across the region. You know, Governor Cooper had put out a message earlier today warning people to be careful um, with the snowfall because it really is affecting the entire state. So some of the people in line are going to go to North Carolina who are familiar with the snow and how to drive. It's just a good reminder of this being the first uh, significant snow that we've had to, to be safe if you do have to go somewhere on the roads and make sure you're giving yourself plenty of time to get there and plenty of space with the car that is in front of you. So again, the snow continues to fall here in our big wall area of the Madison County, just near the Tennessee border. Um, and that, that is a possibility, so it's going to be a mess in the AM. Yeah, so just watch the snow. Same. He actually, he actually well, noticed, he noticed that. Does that have a weird face? Yeah. Here, here he is. He's talking, he's talking to somebody back at the studio or something. Wait, Misty, did I have a weird face? <laughs> wow, there are special effects on the phone. Well, we weren't trying to. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that, uh, actually, what is it doing to my face? It's too funny. Now I'm just having to look back at this video and see what's happening to my face. <laughs> It was a meteorologist with a wizard on the on purpose, I promise, but <laughs> it's too funny. I literally did not do it on purpose, I promise, but I'm glad you guys are enjoying it and you liked it. So, so anyway, that was, I thought that was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was widely reported.
That's, I guess that's kind of mixing entertainment. <laughs> We're almost out of time, but yeah, no, no, no. Where, does, where does this leave us? I mean, I'm a, I love the news. I used to love the newspaper, and it's so like exhausting. And I find myself just reading, like that was way too long for me. So I wanted like a tiny clip. I got the idea and move on to the next thing. Oh, right, right. I don't have any more like stamina to listen and watch and and if we're going to be, you know, the Gilded Age and we're going to change, we're too fat and happy to, to do anything. I don't, I don't well, see if, 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 there's one, if there's one thing you can do is to try to pay more attention to sources and to, and when you see a source that, that you know is a bad source, to not consume that source anymore. So if you, you know, like me, I, 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 Trump, Trump just did a thing today or yesterday where he did, he did a nationwide address or whatever. I didn't watch it. I'm not even going to watch it. I, I was, you know, he's not a reliable source. You know, so I don't, I don't watch him anymore. You know, whether it's a public official or a chant or a, a cable channel, you know, there's certain cable channels that I don't watch anymore. Because because either they put on reliable sources, unreliable sources all the time, or, or they're unreliable. And, and I mean, every, you know, no matter what the source, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. I mean, you're going to see mistakes all the time, you know, from, from, from news outlets. But when you see it consistently or, you know, in, in volume or, or when it's obviously intentional, then, then try to keep track of those sources that are unreliable and the ones that are reliable. And don't consume the ones that are unreliable. And do support the ones that are reliable. And if we all do that, they'll get the they'll get the memo. And, and I would just add one more thing to that, Ron. Uh, is that there's nothing wrong with being a slow news consumer, despite the vast quantities of content that our news organizations, even small local weekly papers, might be generating. You know, find your lane, consume as much news as you want to and are comfortable with, and can remain sane with. If you don't. Watch the president's latest address. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I mean, that's that's good. Um, you know, turn turn it off because there's too much news content out there for us to safely and intelligently absorb um, in a professional way. And, and you know, it's, there's there's just too much information. Yeah, the, 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 the psychic impact, the psychological impact. Yeah. You know? yeah. What I wanted to say about that, um, as you mentioned last night, his address on. Um, Vermont Public Radio. I came in, I was tired, I turned on the radio, and I thought, oh, this is... They talked about, a few before that, it's like, well, they have a bunch of people, and what do you think he's going to say? What do you think he's oh, going to say? Yeah. And it was just that, for God's sake, he's speaking in three minutes. Can we just wait? And then after, they have to talk, talk, talk. The other thing that I remember I turned it off was um, the caucus or the whatever, the election that... Uh, Delayed because of all of the voting issues with machines. The first one, I can't remember. Iowa. And then, yes, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And then they, well, it was supposed to happen at 7. They were going to schedule for the special program at 7. And then they announced that it wasn't actually going to have any results until somewhat later. But they started at 7 and just talked about nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're talking about fatigue. Mm -hmm. Who has time to, to wade through all of that nothing to get something? And that's National Public Radio. And that's, I've really, not been listening to them and I'm at a loss as to who to listen to. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't get the newspapers. And I don't have time now. Yeah. The War and Peace Report. Mm -hmm. What channel? I don't have computer yeah. access at home. Is there a... Is there a They're on the yeah. radio, but I don't know where. That's what I need to know. So yeah. But again... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most, most of the traditional media now have uh, put out a podcast where it's available on the internet, so if you, if you don't know where they are, you can just do a Google search and find them and download it and listen to it right on your computer. Well, that was something on Sunday morning. It's before 6 o'clock, they said, you know, there had been a confirmed case of this virus in Vermont. They had more. So I kept kind of waiting. And then they said, oh, about 9 o'clock, they finally said it'll be at 11 o'clock. Good thing I had something to do in the house the whole time. At 11.04, they said I could go and find it. They lost any passion or something. Something else that, uh, in relation to what I was saying is the way that it's we've come to. You can fast forward to things now, and with with the internet, with with phones, at any given moment you can go 
I lift this up, and you can skip to the part you want, or if it's not holding your attention, here's where they have to hold your attention, so they make it more like entertainment, because everybody is so used to that instant gratification in a sense that you can just push the button and move ahead to the next one. And there's so much there anyway, it's like, well, I'm not going to waste my time. So you're not going to sit and give a given story a chance even half the time. It's like, oh, it's important. Or you don't like the announcer, you know. It's, um, and, yeah, it's... You know, something, something I've been doing is, is uh, like, we don't, we don't get, um, on the cable channel we have here in Norfolk, they don't have WMUR. Which I think is one of the strongest stations that Hearst has. I mean, they're 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 better than than the other Hearst stations in this market, or uh, in, like in Vermont or, or New Hampshire. And what I've been doing is is watching WMR online. And when I I wait until sometimes I wait until after uh, the live broadcast and wait until I can actually, like you say, fast forward to it. Mm -hmm. And their player has a, a two two x speed, so you can. You can watch their their hour show in a half hour, and you can skip through stuff. Mm -hmm. and so that's 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 one way to do it is that you can actually play it faster. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're Without to... missing so much mm -hmm. in between. Yeah, yeah, you can slow enough. Yeah, to yeah. Say, yeah. Wait a minute. And that over time, that's the other thing that's happened. It used to be half hour news, now it goes on hour news. Like WMR, a lot of them are an hour news now. Um, I get WMR on Dish. Dish. Oh, yeah, the sat, sat, yeah, the satellite company. What it is is they. Well, you they, have satellite. It's it's really complicated. There's a there's a rule about this must carry, and we are actually in the Vermont, uh, upstate New York market here, in, in uh, where where we are in Orford, and uh, WNUR is in what they call the Boston market. So the rule is that if if a uh, station is in the market that the cable company serves, mm -hmm. then the, then uh, uh, they can opt out, but they, mm -hmm. they they would be able to get the content for free yeah. from the from the news uh, from the station. Um, but because WNER is in a different market, the only way that Topshin can get put that on their cable system is if they pay WNER. It's just and they you know it's just a small cable company they can afford it by the company. Going directly to the internet, it's called uh, over the top or TT, which means you're, you're, you're getting content that would normally be on the cable or, or broadcast or whatever, you're taking it through the internet. And so it's a way to subvert all the rules of conversation. <laughs> One thing I like about it, though, is <clears throat> we watch uh, our news at night when we were in bed, uh, but the national news. It's a half hour show, but when you watch it on the internet, it's it's a seventeen minute show. <laughs> <laughs> well, three minutes is that what you said? Three 17. minutes? Seventeen. <clears throat> it depends upon what the, like if you watch C SPAN, I mean you gotta sit through it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Watch people like, come in and I, hand papers out on the desk yeah, and they yeah, go yeah. out and it's like it's like what is going um, on? No wonder nothing gets done. Well, I watch yeah. C SPAN when there's public hearings and all that stuff. That's what I watch. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I turn it on and I read something else or browse and then it's all the time. Well, this was good. Yeah, okay. This, yeah, thank you all for showing up. Well, thank, you. Very, thank you. Very thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really, yeah. I mean, it's not that encouraging, but still. <laughs> well, it's fortified. As part of consuming media, I just need, yeah. to, need to be wary. Well, it's good there's still local journalists and papers around telling stories.